Of all the promotional images of the starship, this is the one that I find the most compelling and mysterious. It just doesn't fit. I mean, the starship is supposed to be taking us to Mars, right? Revolutionizing manned exploration, but making us a multi-planetary species by taking us to Mars, not to the outer solar system. I mean, perhaps to a few other places, but Mars is the primary goal. I mean, perhaps it might take us to the moon, but to a far away place like Saturn, a planet that's 30 times as far away from Earth as, as the red planet is? How is that even remotely possible? Is this just a pretty image to make us excited? Or is there something more behind it? Well, it might not be so impossible after all. Using the technology depicted in this ship, and by the way, that's not our moon back there, but one much further away. No, utilizing a drive called Plasma Drive in this ship, the starship might be able to take us to the outer solar system after all, because this ship could take us from Earth to Mars in 39 days. to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. By the way, that imagery, that stunning imagery, was provided by Fragomatic again. I have linked his site, and I encourage you to visit and subscribe today. He has been so generous with his creativity. Also, the designs that you have seen was created by the Ad Astra Rocket Company, and all of their copyrights are included in my description as well. Okay, all of that having been said. Needless to say, I'm pissed as hell. Once again, we have a technology that's been around since the 1970s. Technology that if we had remained focused on it, we would not only have colonized Mars by now, we might be colonizing the outer solar system. Sound impossible? Well, let me explain. So, what the folks at Ad Astra are working on is something called VASIMIR, or Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma Rocket. Whew, that's a mouthful. Now, as we learned with nuclear thermal propulsion, the faster you can get your propellant to leave the nozzle of a rocket, the less fuel you use and the more efficient your rocket. But instead of just heating the fuel with a nuclear reaction, the Vasmir ionizes and superheats a neutral gas such as argon or xenon using high energy radio waves, converting the fuel into something called plasma. And by the time it leaves the nose cone of the rocket, it's at an unbelievable temperature, 1 million degrees Celsius, and traveling at 50,000 meters per second. So when your fuel is leaving your ship at 110,000 miles an hour and is 173 times the temperature of the surface of the sun, virtually anything is possible. This is like something out of science fiction, and yet it's been around since 1977, and it puts the outer solar system within our grasp. Now how do you contain something this hot without melting your ship? 
Well, since the plasma is magnetic by nature, you can use magnetic fields instead of material to contain it, at least in theory, and test versions of the engine have been fired thousands of times, but still you probably want to start off small with something like this. And this is the small version. Something called a lunar tug carried in the nose cone of a conventional rocket to Earth orbit. And its function, although conservative, is extremely useful. Now heating plasma to the insane temperatures that I was just talking about would require a nuclear reactor at least. This version is far, far safer. It utilizes solar panels, 1 to 200 kilowatts worth of power, to heat the plasma and ionize it and use the fuel at a much, much lesser degree, but still very efficiently. So essentially this is a slow cargo hauler, but here's the advantage. Cargo coming up from the surface into low Earth orbit, let's say the new Glenn, can deliver 45 metric tons to low Earth orbit, whereas only 13 tons to a geosynchronous transfer orbit to the moon. So instead, you deliver your 45 tons to the lunar tug, and then the tug takes that much, much larger amount of cargo the rest of the way to the moon, using a minuscule amount of fuel in the process. Now the fuel they would use would probably be argon, which is only $40 a kilogram versus $2,000 a kilogram for xenon. But here's where this particular tug becomes in very, very useful with our current plans for the moon. Back when this idea was first conceptualized, the most expensive aspect of the whole setup was the fact that any lander you were using to deploy the cargo had to carry typical chemical propellant. But with the Lunar Gateway, you don't need that. Instead, the tug delivers its 45 tons of cargo to the Lunar Gateway instead of the process being depicted here, the tug goes back to get more cargo and then the gateway deploys the cargo to the surface either with reusable landers using fuel manufactured on the moon or with the lunar space elevators I described in the past. So much more efficient and barely using any fuel and so much more cargo. So let's review and see what this system could do once it was fully established. It could take the New Glenn's 45 tons instead of 13 to the Lunar Gateway, or it could transport the Falcon Heavy 64 tons to the Lunar Gateway instead of 17. Very efficient and for about the same price. And yet, somebody decided it was too expensive way back in 2010, they canceled it and spent money on the SLS instead. Okay, before you get too pissed off, let's talk about how this could work on the Starship. Like the nuclear thermal propulsion that we talked about in a previous video, you would still need chemical rockets, in other words the BFR, to take the Starship into orbit. That would still be a necessity. But once the BFR is detached, then, perhaps with a little bit of help with some chemical boosters, you engage the Vasimir and the Starship is on its way to Mars with a 29-day transit time. 29 days in microgravity, 29 days exposure to cosmic rays, and also the possibility of a quick return in the case of an emergency, which would be impossible with a six-month transit time. There are so many advantages. Disadvantages, of course. Low yield uranium may not work on this, for example. You need all the power you can possibly get for this kind of engine system. But nevertheless, had we been working on this since 1977, we might have had all these problems worked out and making our way in a Vasmir powered starship to the red planet 
in 29 days instead of six months. And Mars might very well be colonized and far beyond that. Remember this ship? Well, it's called the HOPE, or short for Human Outer Planet Exploration, powered by Vasimir Plasma and that little spinning habitation system that you see provides one-eighth artificial gravity, which is interesting because it's designed to go to Callisto, the outermost moon of Jupiter, which also has one-eighth Earth gravity. Now this concept may seem kind of nuts because Jupiter, as many of us know, is loaded with radiation, and even at these speeds it would take a little over two years to reach Callisto, but the voyage of Magellan took about three years. It puts things in perspective. Plus, Callisto is an ideal place for a base, loaded with water ice, geologically stable, plus quite a magnificent view, and very close to Europa, which is perhaps the most likely place in our solar system where we can find life. And then, once we have a self-sustaining base on Callisto, it's on to Saturn, and Titan, and all the other wonders that wait for us there. Now isn't this starting to get a bit ridiculous? All these years of travel in close quarters, in one-eighth gravity, one-eighth gravity on the Vasimir, one-eighth gravity on Callisto? I mean, how could Earthbound humans possibly survive that? Well, perhaps Earthbound humans couldn't, but Martian humans might. Living in one-third gravity instead of full gravity, enduring radiation, recycled air, eating hydroponic and aquaponic foods, living under the most difficult conditions, sometimes deep in lava tubes with a poisonous atmosphere, but witness to some of the most magnificent sights in the solar system, would they not be driven to go on to see something even more magnificent? Would Martian humans not be better suited to explore the outer solar system? And if so, is this just a pretty picture? Or is it a prophecy of things to come? So, you just heard me say that People accustomed to one-third gravity, namely Martians, will be better suited to explore the outer solar system than people from Earth, simply because of what they grew up in. And there's some very good reasons for that. We are the only rocky planet or moon, aside from Venus, and I don't even want to talk about that, that has the gravitational pull that we do. It's this immense gravitational pull that's kept us tied to this planet for as long as it has. If it was just a little bit more, we couldn't escape it. So the question I have to those who would suggest artificial gravity for those people from Earth that would want to explore the solar system, is this something we should actually do? I mean, it's quite a challenge to begin with, but even if we can overcome it with some sort of massive rotating habitation dome, something very expensive, difficult to produce, is this something we should really move forward with? Because after all, as I mentioned before, Earth is the only planet with this issue. Every other planet and moon in the solar system has so much less gravity than we do, as I say, except Venus. Instead, I see a different sort of future that I'm not sure has ever been talked about on YouTube before. What I foresee is a future with two types of humans, or perhaps several types. Those who decide to stay in the comforts of Earth and those who choose to explore. Those who choose to explore Mars or Europa or Callisto or wherever it might be. And for those who would say human beings simply couldn't give those things up, I would answer, well, yeah, 
These folks might never see an ocean, but they will explore the subsurface oceans that exist beneath the surface of most of the moons of the gas giants, at least the large ones. What an adventure there. They may never ski down a slope, but they could dustboard down the slopes of Olympus Mons, performing amazing tricks in one-third gravity that we could only dream of. Think of the future that those people might have to look forward to, and then ask yourself, would they really want to come back? Some of them might not. If we really want to be a multi-planetary species, then we also need to be the types of humans that embrace the types of planets we intend to colonize, rather than trying to completely change them into something else. Now, I've got no problem with terraforming Mars, but we're never going to change its gravity, and I don't think we should try. It's just my opinion, and I would very much like to see your responses in the comments. But until then, and until we can get to Mars in 39 days, and to the outer solar system as well, stay angry about space.